So I figure that I have probably the easier job today here because I'm going to talk about very nice things, features that come into OpenShift. So Dan uh, helped me a lot by talking one of them. So that means I'm going to have to talk less about it. Um, and some of the features that I'll talk a little bit, you also have a dedicated session by my colleague as well, Paul Moore, later on, right? So the objective of this is to introduce you to a few new things that we are developing and thinking about developing the OpenShift uh, for the next, uh, uh, let's say, one or two or three releases that we think ahead. We often try to think ahead at max of a year because we know that uh, uh, things change a lot. So that's, uh, that's what we do. My name is Diogenes Retori. That's my Twitter. I'm a product manager right ahead responsible for OpenShift. And my main areas of responsibility in the product are essentially things that run on the platform uh, and, let's say, application services related uh, capabilities on OpenShift, which I'll talk a little bit about them as well. Very happy about this. We all know, right, uh, that uh, Red Hat decided to acquire CoreOS. So b before the deal is actually finished and the transaction is completed, we cannot make any comments about it other than what's already stated in our blog. So maybe in like a few weeks or so, we'll be able to state our plans, uh, our objective is the technology, but uh, we need the transaction to be completed before, again, we can make any claims. So anything that you hear from anyone is probably not true until the transaction is finished. Uh, but again, that's, it's a definitive agreement to acquire. We can though say that we are very, very happy uh, with this decision and to have awesome engineering, um, engineers that are going to continue to work together in the technology that they already love, right? Um, and let's get into the, the interesting things about this right now, right? Uh, things that we're doing uh, in OpenShift to make OpenShift even more awesome. I know probably a uh, lot of you here are OpenShift users, OpenShift developers, OpenShift contributors. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about the things that we're doing. Uh, and you know that OpenShift uh, uh, has Kubernetes underneath. So I think it's, it's valid to talk also a little bit about the things that are in Kubernetes 1.9, uh, which are going to come to OpenShift soon, right? Uh, the, this Kubernetes 1.9 release was called as a stabilization release, but there are lots of capabilities coming in there as well. But from, from the perspective of the community, it's seen, let's say, as, let's say, let's get lots of bug fixes in. Let's get uh, the, uh, some capabilities to be at a stable stage. Let's migrate some capabilities from, a, from alpha to beta or from beta to GA stage. So this, is, uh, this was the main target for this Cube 1.9 release. Um, the, worker, uh, the workloads API, it's probably the big one that uh, capabilities move from a, a beta to a GA stage. And I'm especially uh, um, happy to see stateful set there, right? Uh, how many of you know what stateful set is in Kubernetes? Good. So we have about 25% of the room. I think it's worth explaining a little bit. So the, the, when Kubernetes was first created uh, tra a little over three years ago, uh, the objective was to address mostly cloud-native workloads, mostly ephemeral workloads, right? things that will go away. Right? Uh, you have a new container. If that container is bad, you kill that container and you wait for a new one to come up. Uh, you assume that that container is probably a cloud-native application that does not care necessarily much about its host name, doesn't care much about his identity, right? So the objective of stateful sets is to assign an identity to a running container that is going to be maintained across life cycle of that, across that, the deployment life cycle of that container. So if for some reason that container, let's say, dies, when it comes back up, it comes back up with the exact same identity. So a use case that I think loves that, databases. Databases love their host name. Databases love their IP. Databases love their storage they are attached to. Right? So that is a very important feature that's coming to, uh, to GA and Cube 1.9 and to OpenShift as well. Right? So um, uh, mostly uh, uh, use cases that are, again, are, have a very warm in relationship with an identity, with where they are running, they, are, they can be run more successfully with, uh, with stateful sets. Another thing about stateful sets as well is that uh, uh, it has a, an order for when things need to come up. So if before a database you need to come up with an agent, or if before, let's say, a, a, an application you need a, a monitoring tool to come up first with that application. So it allows you to assign a order of execution for things inside one or across multiple pods. So that is a very good thing. Um, daemon set, you probably know daemon set. Daemon set, it's a container that's going to run in every node. Uh, so if you need things, things to run in nodes, for example, mostly we see uh, like log scrapers that have to run in every node, that's a daemon set. And the others, uh, 
they are very popular, we already know them. Um, Windows support, uh, lots of contribution from, uh, from, from Microsoft in this. Uh, Red Hat is also involved, so the Windows support and beta uh, for Kubernetes. <clears throat> and this is good because this is, um, allows you to have uh, hybrid clusters, right? So clusters that will be some nodes running uh, Windows containers, some nodes running Linux containers, right? Remember, a Windows container can only run Windows, a Linux container can only, can only run on Linux. So uh, when we say uh, Kubernetes support for Windows, that, is gonna mean, that means that you're going to have a Windows package container that's going to run on a win Windows uh, operating system, right? Uh, and uh, for the diversity of workloads, uh, the, the Node team and the SIG, uh, they invested in allowing pods and allowing containers to have more access to node capabilities, right? Uh, for example, C uh, actually CPU pinning, not CPU pinning, CPU pinning, device plugins, and hardware acceleration. If you know a project called KubeVirt, which is targeted at running virtual machines inside Kubernetes, so these are all capabilities that uh, we expect from virtualization solutions, right? To be able to, let's say, to pin to a specific CPU, to use the device, uh, uh, device plugins in the host, so that's an uh, that's important capability as well. Um, and that's more, and that's, that's lots more. Any questions about this? Good. So you probably know that uh, th these features are going to come in OpenShift 3.9. We follow that, that release uh, naming, so if OpenShift 3.9 means Kubernetes 1.9. Um, now, uh, the, from a, let's say, community organizational perspective in the Kubernetes community, uh, the community is, 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 is growing, and in order for, for that to grow in a healthy state, some processes have to be established. For example, how you submit a proposal for a new capability. So that has been uh, established as a community norm as well, uh, so that if you, want, if you have a new idea that you want implemented in Kubernetes, there is somewhat of a process that you have to follow for that uh, idea now. Um, uh, continue to involve in the creation of more six. Now this is, uh, if there is like one slide that normally I would take a picture would be this one. Uh, so these are the, the things that we Red Hat are investing across the container ecosystem, right? So this is not necessarily OpenShift. Uh, this is not only OpenShift. This is where Red Hat is putting uh, our efforts from marketing and from engineering perspective to make uh, OpenShift more successful but that means investments not only in OpenShift, right? Uh, from the, and hopefully I'm not gonna go through all of them, I'm just gonna cover a few of them that are especially very dear to my heart, uh, which is uh, cloud native work uh, runtimes for, for OpenShift. Uh, so Red Hat is providing uh, runtimes to run on applications that uh, understand Kubernetes environments. So if you want to configure a Java application using config maps, for, for config maps, for example, we have uh, libraries that will understand that environment. Uh, also, service catalog and brokers. So if Paul Moore, I'm not sure he's here. He's going to be here soon. We're going to have a session dedicated on service broker and catalog. I'm not going to address that. Um, again, Windows containers. Uh, also, a, 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 a data platform based on Spark. And another very, very nice technology that I have a little bit more about it. Uh, uh, called Istio. How many of you are following Istio or Service Mesh? Okay, pretty good. So we have one, uh, good, that you're following that. <laughs> now, because we have one of the Istio community members here that happens to be a Red Hat employee that's going to be answering <coughs> questions on Istio uh, on the panel very soon. So thanks for coming. Um, I think uh, the big item for us, uh, uh, Cryo already mentioned, but it is an item here called Cluster Operation, right? Uh, uh, we Red Hat, we manage ourselves a lot of clusters, right? Uh, like, um, let's say, close to 100 clusters. I would say that we have Kubernetes and OpenShift cluster that I would say that we manage for many various purposes. We have our own OpenShift dedicated business that customers can acquire a managed cluster from us. We have uh, OpenShift Online, which is also many, many clusters. And it's our interest to make that operation uh, even more uh, 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 automatable, right? So a, a technology uh, that we are going to invest in the next year is called Cluster Operator. It's going to follow the Kubernetes uh, model. So the objective of Cluster Operator is that you're going to define a state of how you want your cluster to be. And in the same way that you define in Kubernetes a state of how you want your application to be, and Kubernetes maintain that state, uh, it's going to be the same for a Cluster Operator. So you will describe your cluster, and then the Cluster Operator will always keep that uh, that, um, that cluster in that state. It will also help you with automated upgrades, automated downgrades, 
uh, uh, automated uh, uh, addition or removal of nodes. So it's going to be a very big project for us, again, to allow uh, our customers to have a more automated operation of clusters and to allow Red Hat itself to become more capable of automating multiple clusters. Of course, it will be open source. Of course, it will be available to you all. It will continue to use the underneath uh, uh, Ansible, uh, sorry, the playbooks that we already have, uh, and then interacting with those Ansible playbooks. So if you already know the Ansible playbooks, those will be evolved, those will be likely breaking apart so that the cluster operator can interface with those playbooks and do state-based cluster management, uh, the same way we do uh, state-based and declarative-based application management inside Kubernetes. Um, let me see, of the ones that I think are interesting as well, um, especially to me, um, uh, I'm gonna have a little bit more details about this. So, one of the things that we do, of course, is to, f is to focus on the stability, and I think just on, on cube 1.8 and 1.9, I think we, between, uh, between uh, the cube release and the R release, like we had to fix more than, I think, 180 bugs in Kubernetes that we thought was critical, so uh, our work as, as, a, as in the community is to uh, chop wood and carry water, so it's about fixing bugs, making Kubernetes stable, making Kubernetes consumable in the enterprise, so that is, that is a lot of the work that we do. Um, and for 3.7, which is launched already, we also uh, uh, made features uh, uh, to, a, uh, to a more stable stage. Uh, as, as, as we learn a lot from our own online clusters, we discover that uh, some of the way some of the, let's say, the API calls or the, or the call aggregation or the, the data coming back from APIs they tend to be a uh, very, let's say, uh, a, a large payload. And we learned a lot. Um, I think it's fair to say that we are probably running uh, one of the most diversely dense clusters of OpenShift out there because we have OpenShift online and you can have all sorts of workloads there from, from different runtimes, from different types of application, from Bitcoin miners, for example, they're using it, which we try to shut down and we do shut down many of them every single day. Um, you know, that's what happens when you put uh, free compute capacity on the internet, right? Uh, so, but that, uh, for, our, for the community, for the, for the OpenShift community, that is a, the best thing that could happen because we learn so much from that experience of having our, our own, let's say eating our own uh, dog food, of having OpenShift there running, that uh, as part of the OpenShift development process, things don't go to the product if they have not been baked in online, right? So whenever you see a release of OpenShift Container Platform, that means that those features, they've been tested and run in OpenShift Online, and we know how to operate them, we know uh, how much they can handle in terms of scale, uh, we have fixed lots of security bugs, because you know we don't want people getting into a, uh, a, a OpenShift node online, stealing your AWS credentials and going crazy about it, so, I mean, it, I would say it's a safeguard, the fact that we run it first, that we're willing to shoot ourselves in the first, first before you do that, right? Uh, and for OpenShift Pro, which is the paid offering for OpenShift, that is, let's say, the same uh, OpenShift uh, that uh, you can get with OpenShift Container Platform. And it is the same thing that's in GitHub as well, right? So we just, uh, when we, re we release OpenShift Container Platform, there is also a, a GitHub release for that. So we're not afraid of open source. Um, so again, uh, we made changes to facilitate uh, uh, and to, uh, to make uh, pulling content from the API server in a more organized way that allows, uh, allowed us to scale, right? Uh, literally uh, hundreds of tons of, uh, of, of containers, tons of thousands of containers. Uh, that, that's a lot of metadata that the, that the cluster generates, and we need to access that metadata to make the smart decisions about where to run those containers, for example. So that is one of them. Uh, also in that, in that sense, uh, the diversity and density of the clusters, talked a little bit about this. Um, uh, if you've seen, uh, we all know that Prometheus is popular, uh, so we're bringing Prometheus to OpenShift before. Uh, we had our, our focus in a technology called Hocular, but uh, I think we've been pretty good at joining successful communities, so we decided to join this very successful community called Prometheus as well, and, Open, and Prometheus is going to become uh, uh, the supported uh, monitoring technology for OpenShift. We're already shipping it with the product, but as a tech preview stage. And it's a two-way, uh, uh, two-step two program, let's say, for this, is that first we want to allow the cluster itself to be monitored using Prometheus, so that a cluster operator or a cluster administrator can see the state of a cluster uh, with Prometheus. And the next step will be individual applications 
to use Prometheus to monitor their applications. Customers have already been doing this, users have already been doing this, but we want to provide a, 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 a supportable and sustainable path for our uh, users to continue to do this. Um, now, if uh, the intent to acquire CoreOS, uh, we're going to have also very bright engineers that already know a lot about Prometheus, so that's another very good uh, advantage of that. Um, so, uh, auto scaling has been in OpenShift and Kubernetes for quite some time. I think it was 1.1 1 .1 or 1 1.2 that it first got in, uh, but there has been lots of changes in that. So, with the, the current version that we have, and this is one of the SIGs that we lead, the SIG auto scaling. It's led by a colleague of mine uh, back in Boston. We have the ability to have a custom metrics API to do custom metrics based auto scaling, which is what makes sense. You know, CPU works for maybe like 80 to 90 percent of the use case, but sometimes uh, your application might require you to auto scale based on a business related metric. Right? For example, a, you want a SLA, you want a HTTP transaction response time, or you want other uh, other types of, of metrics that, uh, that will trigger an auto scale in your pod, right? So this is uh, available, and Kubernetes already it's coming to OpenShift 3.9. Uh, so it's through the uh, HPA custom auto scaler. You can also, for example, there's a plugin wrote uh, written for for Prometheus that uh, you configure the auto scaler to query a, uh, or certain to to use a Prometheus query to uh, to define whether or not something should scale up or down. So that's a very powerful uh, scaling tool. See how am I every time? I have no clock. I have a clock here. It's weird. Um, flex volume. So uh, this is again allowing us to to run uh, other types of workloads uh, on OpenShift as well. Um, network continued network. Uh, IPv6. It's it's interesting. Some industry, especially the telco industry, requires IPv6 a lot. Some uh, not so. Pretty much, it's in, it's been a major one asked by telco. I almost say. A, a showstopper for telco industries, so um, uh, that's why our investment is there as well. Continue work on network policy. How much do you know? How much of you here know what network policy is? Good. So I think it's worth a little bit, maybe like five percent. Uh, so network policy allows you to have fine-grained control over the network communications that happen inside uh, your cluster, right? So if you have two projects or two namespaces or Kubernetes namespaces or projects you want to say, I want a pod in a single project to interface with a pod in another project and only that and no other network connection between these two pods, you can do that via network policies, right? So if you have, for example, an application and a database and you don't want uh, any other uh, application to interface with that database but the application that, uh, the, the pod that's interfaced with that application, you can do that using network policy. There are other ways you can do that as well, but this is to, let's say, create a network level protection and, and granularity and control over what you can do with, uh, with that. So uh, a great contribution from, uh, from, from Tigero and this. So they were the ones that uh, first came up with this. So this is just powerful to see uh, uh, the community helping everybody become more successful. Tigero, I think it's a Commons member, if I'm not mistaken. So good to see that happening. Um, so storage, this, is, this has been uh, long waited by uh, some of our customers is that uh, uh, a request that I got like in the early days was, I have my database and I want my database to run in a node that I have SSD attached and I want that database to keep running on that node forever because, because I want to do it, but I want to run it in container, right? So you kind of have a storage based pod scheduling. You know, I want my application to land on nodes that have this specific type of storage, and the storage, it's a locally available storage because that application requires uh, uh, very low latency and fast, uh, fast storage. So this is one of the capabilities that we, uh, we are working and, and soon come up to a, to a DA stage, but it's still an alpha, but again, it's ability to uh, Store, local storage based scheduling of applications. So as you can see, Kubernetes, we kind of solved 80, 90% of, of use cases. Now we're starting to get into more complex scheduling and execution use cases to really run every single application out there. Um, also resizing snapshotting, that's self-explanatory. Um, let me go, this is, this is covered. Um, this is, so Paul Moore is going to talk a little bit about this. Paul Moore is a Red Hat engineer. He is the lead for the service catalog work uh, in Kubernetes. Uh, and I know he has a very nice demo to show you. Uh, but I want you, uh, 
how many of you actually have seen this, the container catalog or uh, service broker? So good. Um, Red Hat's objective with this is that we want your uh, application catalog of things that can run both inside and outside of the platform to be consumed from, op from the OpenShift catalog, right? We have developed a broker API that allows you to publish applications, again, that can run either inside or outside of OpenShift, and you can trigger the execution of these applications from inside. If you saw uh, the announcement we, we made when we launched 3.7, and the beginning of December, we announced the AWS Service Broker, actually uh, AWS announced the AWS Service Broker for OpenShift, and that is a way for you to consume AWS services from an OpenShift cluster. It doesn't matter where that OpenShift cluster is running. So you have OpenShift running on-premise, you want access to an RDS uh, database, or you want access to, let's say, an S3 bucket, or a SNS, or SQS, you can consume that from your local OpenShift cluster. Of course, the service is always running on the cloud, but the, the negotiation and creation of the service is done via the, via the service broker uh, and interfacing with, in that case, uh, CloudFormation's templates uh, on AWS, and you don't necessarily have to, 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 to know this, right? You just go to your OpenShift cluster, you say, I want S, SNS or SQS, for example, uh, you can pre-configure your AWS credentials or you can use your AWS credentials exactly at that moment and then you have a representation of a queue or a topic or a database inside your local OpenShift clusters so that your application can bind to, you know, so that you can have and share those uh, SNS or SQS credential and connection information shared with this, your application. So this is powerful. The, where I see this going is that eventually this will become a, let's say, a application and service catalog for companies uh, for both things that run inside and outside of the platform. Uh, the investments we are making this, uh, in, in this now, can I have a little bit of water, please? I think that one on the left. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Thanks, Diane. Talking fast enough? Yes. yes. So we all know that organizations have uh, policies that they need to, to enforce, and, and so far uh, the services that are published in the catalog, they're available to anyone, right? Uh, but I know, and I've done this, is that you, you don't want necessarily a production database exposed into a development environment, right? So the work we're doing uh, upstream now is to create governance around the services that are exposed and available in the catalog. So you would say, this user, this namespace, uh, can see services related to production services. This user in another namespace can see services that are related to development services or QE services, right? Um, so this is the work we've been doing. Um, we expect to have uh, the work done on this by, by 3.10, end of June, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, all the dates apply, the date uh, uh, exceptions apply that we might change, but we've been pretty stable in, in the releases. Um, and uh, this is on the governance side. So because if, if we assume that uh, this catalog is going to become the, cat the enterprise catalog, we're automatically saying that we're going to have hundreds or, or, or thousands of services published in the catalog used by different uh, groups within the company. So we want governance around that. Uh, on the automation side, we want to have the same uh, easy experience that we had even in OpenShift 2, is that you could just have your application and say, connect to this database and pre it. Uh, you will need to do anything else. All the credential and connection information uh, will be shared. So we're going to, um, this will be, let's say, the first step towards automating. Um, I'm going to evolve a little bit this use case with you now. You have a Java application that needs to connect to an Oracle database. What does your Java application need? You need a JDBC driver for Oracle, right? Uh, um, so you can uh, include that as part of your, uh, as part of your um, um, uh, build process in your image. But we're also going to invest in creating uh, binding-based build and deployment triggers so that we can notify your build process that this binding requires something that you might not necessarily have. Right? If you're going to bind to, uh, to a, a, an application that requires a specific library, we want the build process to be notified. So that means that if you're doing your build in OpenShift, your build process will see and maybe have a, a image source or, or a, a volume mounted that will contain the dependencies that the bind needs to happen. So this is, uh, this is uh, the level of automation we want to go is that you, the platform knows a lot and you shouldn't be needing to tell the platform the things it knows already, right? So that's, a, that's where we're gonna go. Uh, install and upgrade, uh, I talked about this already with the cluster operator, so that was going to be on our big investments for this year. Uh, 
uh, the, we want, uh, in order to do that, uh, it's not only a matter of automating, but it's a matter of also creating artifacts that allow for easy <laughs> deployment of, 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 of nodes, right? So we're going to be creating uh, golden images for OpenShift nodes, for example, so that you don't need to install RHEL and then install OpenShift and then do something else. You have this very nice image that already has everything, and it will connect to a master, pull its configuration, and, and that. So we ran a few tests already, and we were able to, to stand up a 100-node cluster in about seven to eight minutes. And before that, you would need, let's say, three to four hours to do that, you know? And remember that we, do, we need this ourselves for our own dedicated business, uh, an online business, so, uh, and everything that we do there, it's, again, going to be available to anyone at the exact same time. It's going to be developed, of course, in the open. So again, the objective is to facilitate how you stand up OpenShift clusters, how you destroy them, how you add nodes, how you remove nodes with golden images of OpenShift nodes. Um, Continue to work on the Cloud Forms uh, tool, or Manage IQ, uh, uh, the tool that uh, we, uh, we use to manage OpenShift itself. It's called Cloud Forms, and the upstream, upstream open source project is named uh, as Manage IQ. Um, uh, we're working also on the allowing you to, to have reports that show the consumption of usage of a specific image. So if you need, for example, to, to show to your organization that a, uh, or to charge uh, a group of your organization uh, based on the usage of a specific image that has uh, uh, a product that's licensed and you need uh, whoever is using that image to, to, or to cost center to pay for that, that is going to be available in, in cloud forms. Uh, so guess what the next OpenShift version will be? So we launched 3.7, the next one is? 3.9, so we were paying attention, pretty good. Uh, so it's going to be 3.9, so what happens to 3.8? Yes, it's going to be original, and we're going to, from a product perspective, we're combining the two releases. Now, I say skipping is like a bad thing, right? So we're going to combine the 3.8 and 3.9 release. Uh, you know, the good thing about this is that uh, sometimes people complain that, yeah, Red Hat is behind, OpenShift is behind, Cube releases. So the day we launch OpenShift 3.9, Cube 1.9 will still be there, you know? So it's kind of, you know, okay, you were saying we're behind? Not anymore, you know? Find something else to say, you know? Uh, <laughs> Uh, and that's it. So uh, some of our goals, again, continue investing a lot in, in bug fixes and improvement. And uh, let's talk about the things that I appreciate. And I know I'm jumping slides here real quick, which are the services that run on the platform. This is actually the thing I'm especially passionate about. So Red Hat is investing in a serverless uh, technology for OpenShift. Um, uh, some of the, some of the tech, uh, early uh, decisions in the technology was to use uh, OpenWhisk, but we understand that the, the market for serverless is still very much in flux, but uh, we are heavily investing in serverless technology for OpenShift and for Kubernetes. Or you can call it function as a service. I prefer than serverless. There will always be servers, right? They're just not yours. Um, uh, so we understand that uh, there are many ways you can define uh, an application today uh, in Kubernetes. So for example, you can use uh, charts, for example, to define application, you can use uh, like kcompose if you're bringing in from Docker, you can use OpenShift templates. I think a colleague did a, actually a research, there are 18 ways to define uh, uh, an application inside OpenShift or Kubernetes, right? And although each of these ways they have a good reason, uh, we want uh, to try to, as m with most standards, you know, we want to try to come up with a new way that will make the best thing of all these ways, and the result is 19. Now, so uh, the, the objective is, uh, is to try to come up with, uh, in the community, with a standard way of defining what an application looks like, right? So it's going to be a Red Hat not enforcing our own will, but really working with the community. I think so far, there's been a lot of good discussions around the next version of Helm, uh, Helm 3, so I would say we're trending towards uh, Helm 3 at the moment, even though it only exists in paper and not, it does not exist in technology, but that's what uh, we've been thinking about so far. Um, I have some email here, Dan, you need to work on that. Okay. Okay. Uh, and then service mesh. Uh, so you have an uh, opportunity to ask Christian Post uh, around service mesh. Uh, Michael has prepared very nice questions about service mesh as well. Uh, but the, the, the objective of service mesh is to transfer to the platform uh, capabilities that were on, uh, once available uh, in, uh, in the language platform. So for example, if you want to add circuit breaking, uh, let's say fault injection, AB, AB routing, or any specialized routing, uh, uh, before this, you would have to uh, uh, use uh, client-side libraries if you wanted to do, for example, circuit breaking, right? And the objective of Istio is to allow that to happen at a platform level, right? 
so that you have the platform delivering those capabilities. And the way it does that, going a little bit technical, is that, technical is that it's going to use sidecar containers uh, with a proxy inside, which is uh, the Envoy proxy created by Lyft, that we are also contributors to that, uh, where all the traffic is going to go from proxy to proxy. So that means that the proxy knows uh, where things are going and where things are coming from, and there's a control plane on top of that where we're able to, to say, okay, pod A can talk to pod B. Uh, if, uh, um, uh, if someone else wants to talk, that's not allowed. Or uh, if I want to do, let's say, circuit breaking, okay, I tried contacting that application three times, I could not do that. I want to, let's say, open the circuit and not allow, uh, or, or, or not uh, have to wait for the application, uh, or let's say, denial of response or timeout to come back. Uh, and this is, um, so this is another thing we're going to be investing. Uh, very uh, hardly we are already investing in this, and the intention is to be able to show this running uh, in production at Red Hat Summit, uh, which is in about 13 and a half weeks of development left that we have. Uh, pretty tough. We'll get there. Um, it will be uh, available uh, on OpenShift, so it will be uh, something that you install on top of OpenShift uh, and Kubernetes. It's already available on Kubernetes, but. Uh, the, the majority of our work so far, so far has been making sure the capabilities and the components in Istio do not uh, require you to escalate privileges uh, in, in the container. Right? Um, we try to have a security mentality first. Uh, it, it, it often involves uh, hard work to do, but uh, that's what we want to do. So if you were to try Istio today, uh, some of the capabilities require you to, uh, to assign uh, elevated privileges to container. We don't think that's a good thing. We can't do this on OpenShift online, right? Because remember, we run it ourselves, so we couldn't just let containers have a root access uh, in, in the host or in the node. Uh, so these are the things that we're going to fix first uh, and then continue evolving on the others. Uh, if any of you here is interested in, in being part of an early adopter program for issue for OpenShift, please come talk to me directly. Um, be aware that uh, you really have to be able and willing to use this if you want to be part of the early program, early adopter. If you just want to see what we're doing, it's going to be available on GitHub anyway. And that's it. That was pretty fast, I think. Uh, so thank you very much. Uh, Should I have time for questions? Or Do some okay? questions while I set up the, the lightning talk, folks. So if the lightning folks want to come and line up over here, uh, that would be great. We'll make Liz Rice go first. Yes, there, here, there. Come again? Uh, so Windows support, uh, it's going to be provided by Microsoft itself. So Microsoft will have to say that Kubernetes is supported in Windows. So we Red Hat can't claim it. What we can do is we are going to integrate with uh, Kubelets running on Windows nodes. No. No. We don't support Windows. Microsoft supports Windows. <laughs> Cluster Federation. Cluster Federation. Uh, so any work on Cluster Federation? Yes. Uh, the Cluster Federation project took, a, let's say, a different spin or strategy. So they are working today on a, a smaller, uh, more uh, with a small scoped compared to federation called cluster registry, which is to first have a registry of clusters and then uh, work on allowing the resources to be distributed and avail and deployed in multiple clusters. So it's, uh, let's say the federation team thought that it was too much of an undertaking to do, and they said, let's take a step back, let's have a more focused approach, let's, let's fix this problem first, and then see where we go. 